we honor your Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for choosing the Sabbath and then giving it to us as your day of worship. Thank you, Lord. We, we gratefully acknowledge you, the Father of light and the Father of truth and the Father of blessing. And we praise you and we ask you, Lord, to be pleased with what we teach and say here this morning. Let it be your words, not mine. And we ask you, Lord, that you will give peace and joy to the heart of everyone who hear these teachings and cause them to be able to rise up as your children, people of renown, people of the book. And we thank you for all of your good blessings in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Everybody say, Lord, I'm hungry. I ask you to fill me up. And I'm thirsty, Lord. Give me living water. And put some of the wine of the Holy Spirit in there, too. <laughs> and we thank you for it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Baruch Hashem, you may be seated. Yahweh Roe. <laughs> what does that mean? Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. Lo Echsar. I do not want. I was thinking about and praying about what to teach this morning, and then I forgot what God showed me already this week. <laughs> I've been waking up with some of the most awesome dreams. Amen. It's like I'll be waking up and I'm seeing me sharing with people things that God has shown me. And, and it's like he was showing me right there while I was dreaming what he was showing me, you know. <laughs> let's, just for a moment, let's talk about what does it mean to glorify and sanctify God. First of all, you cannot glorify and sanctify him outside of his word. He gives us what he wants in his word. Yes. And what did he tell us? Six days you shall labor. The seventh day is the Sabbath. That God sanctified it to himself in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And he made it clear what day he chose to rest on. He wanted us to have it too, so that we would rest at the same time he is resting. And he being a good God to us, and not only that, but a, a husband and a lover of our flesh, our soul. Uh, he wants us to rest with him and to come into his resting place together as one flesh between us and him. And that's hard for us to comprehend because God's the Almighty. He could kill you just by a snap of his finger or, or just getting distracted for a second. You know? <laughs> so, so I feel a little uncomfortable about thinking maybe I could come to rest in his arms, you know, in his bed. And so that's, that's something that would be uh, a little hard for me to reach for. But that's actually what it means when we are going to come together with him. He wants us to forget about everything else and to think about him on Shabbat. And that means that, that does not mean we're, not, we're supposed to turn our back on widows that are hopeless and helpless. So if we are helping a widow and, this, and we suddenly realize the Sabbath is here, we didn't intend to wake in, work into the Sabbath because we didn't want to break God's commandments, but, but yet that's exactly what he wanted us to do because helping the weakless and the helpless, the weak and the helpless on the Sabbath day, you can't honor him any more than, than by doing that kind of a thing, to do it out of true love and concern for that individual. So there are many things that seem to have contradiction to um, what he says in his word. But that's because it enters into the realm that we talked about last week, which is what is idiomatic, what is um, legalistic, and what is um, the intent of his law. What is 
um, the reality and what is the um, target, the pure, simple target that he's calling us to aim at. And sometimes hitting the target means you have to miss on purpose. I was waiting for somebody to say that. Right, wait a second, miss on purpose. <laughs> like with the widow whose home has a broken roof, and we're out there working on it, and the Sabbath comes up on us before we can get done. We have to get done. We have to get done. We don't have a choice. So God expects us to break the instruction of the Sabbath for that short time because of uh, a good deed that needs to be done for this woman who's otherwise helpless. I mean, if it rains and she's got a hole in her roof, I mean, she could lose all of her valuables. Uh, everything that's important to her, she could lose it. And God doesn't want that. <coughs> so we have to have a higher level understanding of God and his word in order to properly keep his word. Because there are other things. Just like circumcision, according to the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, Yeshua told us that circumcision is a higher command than sacrifice. Well, why is that? Well, it's because that's the bringing of a child into covenant relationship with Almighty Yahweh. What greater commandment is there than that? And so we, we have to adjust our thinking on a lot of different levels in order to truly comply and to truly love God and his commandments, we have to be able to think in a higher plane and understand his heart and his word. Uh, <coughs> so then keeping the Sabbath is something that uh, implies a little bit more than just sleeping in on the Sabbath. I mean, yeah, he wants us to do that, but he wants us to be resting in him. And, and like every day this last week, I have woke up with instructions from Yahweh where he's teaching me on a deeper level. And it's really amazing because I wake up with new levels of understanding. Yeah, it's something I already knew. It was something I had studied many times in the past but I hadn't gotten it to the level that he gave it to me that morning. And so what does it mean then to sanctify the Sabbath? Only God can sanctify the Sabbath, right? Wrong. Wrong. What does it mean that we shall keep his Sabbath that he selected? He chose it. He made the light in the Sabbath. When we set it aside, just like he did, for resting in him, then we are adding to his name. What did, we talked about this just a few weeks ago, what did God say to a Abraham when, uh, I guess Moses, when he was uh, called to go and rescue the people of Israel out of Egypt, uh, he said, Lord, who shall I tell them sent me? And what did he respond? Now say it in Hebrew. Aye, a share, a year. What does that mean? I be happy. I be. <laughs> now, how can us then keeping the Sabbath improve on that? Because it does. It really does. Because it shows our heart's intentions to please him and to make him happy. And because we are trying to make him happy, it makes him happier. Does that make sense? So when he says, I be happy, I be, and then he gives us a Sabbath day and we say, yay, we can do something. So we're going to keep the Sabbath holy. And so then we say, okay, this is the seventh day of the week. God gave us this day, he says, to keep it holy, set it aside as special, so I'm doing it. And he goes, yes! <laughs> Someone's finally doing something I created them to do. 
And that makes him very happy. Amen. Isn't this good? Yes. So what if we choose the wrong day? What if we think that it's Saturday when it's actually Sunday or some other day? Amen. What if we choose the wrong day and, and we don't know it, but we think we're choosing the day that, that he chose? How does he see it? He sees it exactly the same way as if you actually did choose the right day. And then he begins to work on teaching you which day he wants you to keep. This is like I've told in the past. My son called me up one day and said, Dad, I'm keeping the Sabbath. I said, you are? Well, praise God. He said, yep, I'm doing it on Thursday. <laughs> What? <laughs> I said, well, son, you just keep right on studying and God will show you ultimately what's the right day. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't try to change his mind. I just said, you just keep praying about it and asking God to show you what's the best way for him to work, walk and he will ultimately open that up to you. And it wasn't but Maybe another month later, he called me back up and he said, Dad, I, I was wrong. <laughs> the Sabbath is Saturday, and I know that now. And I said, well, good. That's great. Keep up the good work, son. <laughs> That's an encouragement to him. He doesn't think Dad's that way. And most people today do not think God the Father is that way either. They think he's hard and vengeful. He's looking for an opportunity to kill us. No, he's not. All he got to do is stop thinking about you for 30 seconds and you're gone. You don't exist anymore. So God is not trying to kill us. He wants to find excuses for blessing us. Mm -hmm. Do you hear that? Yes. He's looking for an excuse to bless you. And when you start keeping the Sabbath... He gets so excited that he wants to give you a double portion of whatever it is. <laughs> Amen. Joy. Yes. So you are sitting here in this place worshiping Yahweh on the day that we believe is the correct day to worship God on. Not because we have figured it out with our carnal mind, but because God has revealed it to us on a supernatural level. Yes, sir? In the book of Isaiah, Get a microphone, please, so the audience can hear. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, Yahweh's speaking, and he says, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm finding people that are keeping my Sabbaths and my uh, uh, Holy first, day. first of the month. Yeah. New and moons. Then, and, yeah. And, 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 and in new moons. And, well, first of the month is what it says. But right. I thought that was exciting. Absolutely, because who put that moon up there to begin with? And how could any, how could it be possible for any effort of man to create something that is so perfectly aligned with uh, God's calendar? I mean, it's like constantly. It's important to him. It, it adjusts itself for any errors that come up in the seasons. I mean, it's just an automatic adjustment. So, and it is important to him because he gave us a perpetual sign in the heavens of how to know what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. So, God has intended all along for us to be a part of his <clears throat> family. He always wanted us to be called family. Guess who Adam and Eve were? His firstborn children. Firstborn children. Guess who Abraham was? He was a firstborn child of God for his generation. And Noah and all of those who followed uh, the ways of Yahweh. So, I want to skip on down here to I'm going down to the Brich I think. 
Everybody understands Brit Hadasha? New Testament. New Testament, New Covenant writings. Brit means covenant. Hadasha means new. Brit Hadasha, New Covenant. Uh, so we have a firstborn son of God here in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, let's just go to chapter 4 because it's real clear. It says, chapter 4, verse 1, The Spirit, the Ruach, led Yeshua up into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary. To be tempted by the adversary. The Ruach, the Spirit of God, led Yeshua, the Son of God, up into the wilderness. Why? So he could be tempted, tested by the adversary. After Yeshua had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was a little bit hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and the tempter came to him and said if you are the son of God order these stones to become bread but he answered the Tanakh says man does not live by bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. So, Rabbi, does it, doesn't that mean that they can't say the word that the, the, the Old Testament has done away with? Well, does it? <laughs> Good observation, Shane. Good, Shane. How can you know the Messiah if you don't know the Old Testament? It's not written the word. He's on every page. Because, see. Every these words only exist in the Torah. There you go. That's where those words exist, is in the Torah. They don't exist in the New Covenant until Matthew quoted them here. Then that's, they're part of the New Covenant. Are you following me? Well, the adversary wasn't very happy with that answer. So he took him to the holy city, the city of Jerusalem, and set him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, jump off of this place. For the Tanakh says he will order his angels to be responsible for you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not Hurt your feet on the stone. Verse 7, Yeshua replied, But it also says, Do not put Yahweh, your God, to the test. Okay. So if I'm challenging whether God's in me or not, if he's my father, then I'm hurting him. I'm putting him to the test. And he said, don't do that. Where does he say it? It's in the Torah. It's a good book. You should read it. <laughs> but Rabbi, what then about Gideon and the sea? Because God offered that at, to him as a way to know that he could trust God's word. He even gave him that later on when he was standing up on the mountain with all of his soldiers ready to attack the Philistines. And he says, if you, if you don't believe me, then just go down and listen to what the uh, Philistines are saying about you. <laughs> and one of them came out of the tent and said, I've had a dream, I've had a dream. And I saw this barley loaf rolling down the mountain and it squashed all of our troops. <laughs> right. And his partner said, well... Tis nothing but the sword of Gideon and the army of the Lord. <laughs> so Gideon went back 
full of courage, hope, and understanding, right? Yeah. And it, that wouldn't that encourage you? Yeah. <laughs> Does nothing but the sword of Martha. She's coming down the hill. She's <laughs> washing the armies of our people. <laughs> See, God knows what we need. He knows we're but humans. Mm -hmm. He wants to give us what we need in order to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. Now, we are in the last days. There's no doubt about it. And we're standing here watching the fields as they're white in the harvest, and we're seeing that very few people actually are uh, coming to God as real, true converts. They haven't changed from anything pagan to anything else. They're still just as pagan and dirty and unclean as they were the day they heard about Messiah Yeshua. So what are we supposed to do about that, Ronnie? Yeshua gave us the clue, didn't he? He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth workers uh, to this work because the harvest is ripe and the laborers are few. So we need more laborers who truly are true believers <coughs> who have accepted God's word, trust in God's word, are his children that will go forth and help them to understand the truth of God's word because nobody else can do that. So the adversary took him up to the summit of a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all of their glory. And he said to him, all this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. Now, <clears throat> I had a dream exactly like this. Wow. I saw myself ascending in through this cave it was almost like the Lord of the Rings, you know, where you go through this cave and you end up on top of the mountain overlook a city or something. And <clears throat> when I came out on top, I saw little specks of white scattered around the world, just little bitty tiny specks of light. And uh, Satan says, do you know what those little specks of light are? I said, I guess not. He said, that's the last of the resistance. I won. It's a numbers game, and I have beat him. Now, if you will bow down to me and worship me, I will give you this entire thing. It'll be yours. And I said, what, after you ruined it? <laughs> He said, all you have to do is bow down to me. I said, never. I will never bow down to you. I will never worship you. I will never serve you. And not, I, you know, he says, but, but it's all over. I've already beat him. I said, I don't care if you have. Even if you have beat him and the last man has fallen, I still stand and until I am dead and gone, you have an opponent. So, <clears throat> I immediately turned around and walked out of that place. But uh, there's more to that story, but I didn't want to take too much time for it. Uh, what did Yeshua say? Away with you, Satan! What was the word Satan? What does the word Satan in Hebrew mean? Adversary. Adversary. You adversary, get out of my face. For the Tanakh says... Worship Yahweh your God and serve only yeah, him. Yeah, yes, amen. Then the adversary let him alone and angels came and ministered to him. <clears throat> when Yeshua heard that Yochanan had been put in prison, he returned to Galil, the Galilee uh, Modern terms, the Canaret. Come on in, guys. Baruch Hashem, I'm happy to see you. I was starting to feel all alone here, and in walks Reuben with his two sons. Hallelujah. Oh, 
Hallelujah. So then the adversary let him alone, and angels came and took care of him. This is the test of Yeshua in the wilderness. Why did God lead him up into the wilderness? What did it say in the scripture? To be tested of Satan. Did you know that your destiny is no better and no worse than Yeshua's destiny? So if you become a child of the Most High God like Yeshua was, he's the firstborn among many brethren, right? Yes. So if that be the case, what is your destiny? Tested. To be tested. And I love the scripture that Gloria pointed out to me one time when she came in because I was needing it at that day. <laughs> it wasn't one I hadn't known already, but it was one that I needed to hear again. And it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, and the Lord your God will deliver you from them all. Oh, yes. Isn't that an exciting thing to hear? Yes. <laughs> and right in the middle of my big sweating it out test, yeah. God sends a word through Gloria, his servant, <laughs> and gives me that word from Yahweh. Don't think if you hear something and God tells you, go tell this to Rabbi Hall that you're crazy or that he won't believe you. It could be the exact thing I need to hear for that moment. Are you following me? Yes. Or if it's somebody else's name that's plugged in there, not Rabbi Hall. Do it. You don't know what God will be saying to that person through your mouth. Adam, your mouth can be a blessing to people. But you say to yourself, well, I'm not worthy to say anything. I can't ser really serve God. Yes, you can. The devil, Paul, he gets in the way. Paul, I'm talking to you too. Isn't it Paul? Yes, Adam. Adam and Paul. Oh, Adam, reverse. Reverse all that, Lord. <laughs> Paul, even all of us. I'm talking about you and Adam and Reuben and Ronnie and me and everybody else in this room and everybody else even watching this program. You can be a servant of God just simply by doing what he shows you to do, period. One time I was sitting in an auditorium God had sent me there. I, just, I knew that these were prophetic psalmists. That's what they're called, prophetic psalmists. And they would sing songs and they would uh, prophesy to people while they're singing. And I just felt like sitting in the back of the room, in the middle, in the very back of the room. And I had on a, a dark blue tie and my normal coat and pants, okay? And they got up to minister, and I was the first one they called on. I thought they wouldn't call on me because I'm sitting so back in the middle, way back, where they won't think about me, you know. And they said, uh, the guy in the black suit and black tie and white shirt. Well, my tie was not black. It was dark blue. It was navy blue. So I didn't think he meant me. <coughs> I'm sitting there. He says, you, sir, with the black tie. And I looked around to see if anybody was standing, <laughs> and nobody was standing. <laughs> and I said, me? And he goes, yes, you, stand up, the one with the heavy anointing. And so I stood up, and then he didn't really have much to say to me. But what God wanted me to hear, the one with the heavy anointing. I knew it, but I didn't think anybody else knew it. And I wasn't particularly in a mood to tell anybody else. And here it is, broadcast. There was, this whole room was full, and it was a, probably a two or three hundred seat auditorium. And I'm in the very back center of it. And here he is, blatting my name. Essentially, everybody there knew me. And when I stood up, everybody saw me, and they got <gasps> him. <laughs> The one with the heavy anointing? Well, it was God's way that he chose to introduce me to that congregation. A few weeks later, 
another prophetic ministry came to town and I was invited to go and I was going to say no, but God said, tell them, okay, I'll be there. I don't want to go there, Lord. You're going to call that guy to talk to me and I don't want to hear from it right now. <laughs> and the Lord says, just go. I said, the last time you told me to do that, it cost me $600. I had to give every penny I had to a ministry, and I didn't want to do that either. I had to feed my babies. <laughs> Just go. So I went, and this time, instead of sitting in the very back in the middle, I decided to sit on the very front, close to the middle. I figured, well, it didn't work last time. Maybe this will work. <laughs> What does he do? He walks right up to me, puts his finger right in my face. And he said the most profound things I've ever heard from a minister. He says, what is making that noise? Mine? Impossible. Is it your collar? Nope. No? Nope. I, I don't know. Where's the, okay, there it is. Anyway, he said the most profound thing to me I've ever heard. He said, you have been like a horse in the stall waiting for the gate to open. You shall come forth leaping like a lamb and rejoicing. <laughs> now, what he didn't know is that I had had a vision from God. And he told me he was disgusted with me because of my pride and my arrogance and that I was a rebellious, stiff-necked so-and-so, <laughs> and that he couldn't use me as long as I was that way. And so I'm going to have to put you in the stall. And he puts me in the stall and closes the door. And you'll stay there until you learn to submit. And when this guy told me that, I knew that was God's word to me. And it was telling me something nobody else even understood because they didn't know that story. He told me, just to prove to you it's me, I'm going to give you a painting that the artist will not sell. It's not mine. They would... The artist would not sell it, but they're going to give it to you. <clears throat> and about a week later, it, I had that painting. So what are we saying then? Well, God is able to t keep his word, and I can't keep his word, and you can't keep his word, but God can. Well, God is still God, last time I checked. And he doesn't do things my way. Okay, now, how's that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so here we see that Yeshua being the anointed one of God. Okay, bring it up a little. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Okay. Was Yeshua the anointed one of God? Yes. Actually, during this day, he was the only truly anointed one. Not that there, there weren't other prophets and things still working on a lower level. So, <clears throat> Yeshua was the highly favored, highly anointed one. 
And he was led up into the wilderness so that he could be tested by the Satan, the adversary. And so I'm sitting here getting tested and tested and tested and tested and tested. And it's been 40 years of testing, it seems like. <laughs> and I say, like, oh, God, why are you doing this to me? Well, what did he do to Yeshua? His own son. His firstborn son. And so I think I'm better or worse than him. We're all his children, especially when we accept the Messiah. And then the Holy Spirit comes and we now become doubly anointed. Really amazing when you think about it. So, that was the beginning of Yeshua's ministry. I want you to see something in Proverbs 18. And it's verse 20 and 21. A person's belly will be filled with the fruit of his own mouth. Think about that for a moment. Do you know that was in the Bible? <laughs> I was shocked to remember that I used to know that a long time ago and forgot it. <laughs> what is happening when you say, oh, Rabbi, I'm catching a blank? Your belly will be filled with your own words. Or what if I said, Rabbi, I am so blessed a cold can't even come upon me. <laughs> well, you liar. No, I'm telling the truth. Why? Because my belly will be filled with the fruit of my mouth. Are you following me? A, a cold can't come upon me because I'm blessed of the Lord. Allergies can't come upon me because I'm blessed of the Lord. Cancer cannot come upon me because I am blessed of the Lord. Diabetes can't operate in me because I am blessed of the Lord. Yahweh is my healer. And if I got anything that needs to be fixed, He is going to fix it. I'm going to be blessed by the words of my own mouth. A person's belly will be filled with the fruit of the very, very words that he speaks out of his mouth. The tongue, verse 21. The tongue. Everybody stick your tongue out and point at it. The tongue. <laughs> the tongue has power over. The tongue has power over life and death. How do you get any more powerful than that? Those who indulge it must eat its fruit. Ouch. <clears throat> the tongue has power over life and death. When you hear a doctor say something to you about your health, that is hard for your mind to overcome. So the first person that needs to hear the truth is you. Mm 
because that de doctor just lied to you. A lady was in a car wreck. She suffered for years with sharp pains in her neck. I sat down with her to minister to her. I said, I want you to think about this. Exactly when did this pain first come into your body? Was it at the time your car wrecked? Or was it at a different time? She says, well, the first time I heard it, a policeman came up to me and said, are you okay? And I said, yes. And he says, are you sure? Because nobody can have a wreck like this and walk away without harm. Witness number one. <clears throat> She then went to the paramedics to get checked out. And the paramedic said, are you all right? <laughs> yes. Are you sure? Because I've never seen anybody walk away from a wreck like that without injury. <clears throat> Second witness right there. See, the devil knows the law too. In the mouth of two or more witnesses, a thing is established. And she said at that moment, when they said that, I felt sharp pain in my neck. And it's been there ever since. I said, well, they just lied to you, that's all. Well, when you get married, you've got to have two witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you don't know why I'm laughing. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> That's a low cut there, Ronnie. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> what, what I want you to understand is you believe the lies. You have believed the lies. If you have believed a lie about your own body, that lie is contradictory to God's word. So you have to renounce that lie. How do you renounce it? By saying, that's a lie. I don't accept it. I reject it. I am blessed by Almighty God with perfect health, and I don't need these people lying to me like this. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Some of us have recently lost loved ones that have believed the lies of the adversary. <clears throat> and I think that some of them believed the lies because they didn't feel worthy to receive God's blessings. Well, shocker, shocker, nobody's worthy to receive God's blessings. Are you following this? Who's worthy to receive God's blessings? Billy Graham? Jimmy Swagger? Don't laugh. Robert Tilton? Let's name some other big names. All these televangelists? Joel Osteen? Hey, watch your laughing now. If you're ridiculing, you could end up with it back on your back, so please, that's scriptural too. So I know the word well enough to know to keep my mouth shut when it's not supposed to be flapping in the breeze. <clears throat> so the point is that there is none in no in the all capital letters and quotes. None worthy of the blessings of Almighty Yahweh.
to acknowledge that is no problem. <clears throat> I'll be honest with you. I'm not worthy of receiving any of God's blessings. But thanks be to Yeshua, his son, I, I can receive them anyway. I've been chosen to be a part of that holy community, the community of Yeshua the Messiah. Exactly. But I just want to reemphasize this, this verse here. A person's belly. Bring it back up. A person's belly will be filled with the very fruit, the words of his own mouth. Are you sure you don't have an inch? Absolutely sure. Well, I don't think anybody can... Well, that's your fault. That's your defect, not mine. You just look at me because I'm walking away from here without an injury. There you go. Had a guy fall off a ladder. I think I recently told this one. Felt like his arm was all busted up. He called me up about five seconds after it happened. Rabbi, I don't know what to do. I just fell off this ladder. I was working up on the ceiling and I slipped and fell and I've hurt my shoulder. I think my arm's broke. I said, well, you better renounce that right now. Well, how do I do that? Picture yourself up on the top of that ladder. You had faith to believe you wouldn't get killed on that fall, right? Yeah. Well, why don't you have faith that you can't be injured on that fall too? So picture yourself falling off that ladder falling on your arm, getting up, dusting yourself off, and say, thank you, Lord, that I have no injury. Words of your mouth. Your belly will be filled with it. Are you following this? So he did it. And guess what happened to the pain in his arm? Gone! If we could only learn to control with stinking tongue. Our bodies are defiled by corrupt talk. Oh, brother. I just feel so bad. Because I just feel like I just destroyed God's opportunity to bless me. You idiot, don't you know who God is? You're destroying it right now with your words. A person's belly, bring it up again. A person's belly will be filled with the fruit of his own lips, the fruit of his own mouth, the words that proceed out of his mouth. <clears throat> With what his lips produce, he will be filled. Do you believe it? Do you believe it enough to start guarding your lips and don't say things that are negative anymore? You know, when you think about it, even if it's your aunt or uncle or grandmother or whoever, oh, would you please pray for my grandmother? She has cancer of the liver. She's going to die, the doctors say. Well, stupid, everybody's going to die sometime. But it doesn't have to be from what the doctor thinks it is. We need to help those who are being attacked by the adversary over their own health by confessing God's word over it. With what his lips produce. Bring it back up. With what his lips produce, he will be filled. <clears throat> The tongue even has the power over life and death. 
those who indulge in it must eat its fruit. What if your words are to life? Lechaim. If your words that come out of your lips and your mouth and your tongue are for life, you're going to indulge and must eat its fruit. Now, that would not be a bad deal if your words are, are of life and victory. Did you know that most of the people who win at different kinds of games and sports and things, please come in and be seated. I welcome you here, and I'll, I'll be glad to come up and meet you personally after the class. <coughs> I'm telling you, if we only understood how powerful <clears throat> our words are as children of the Most High God, it increases that power. And we are able to speak prophetically over any situation. Did you know that most people who have won an athletic contest or uh, other major hurdle in life have confessed it with their lips first. Did y'all know that? You can see them getting ready for a game. We're number one. We're the champions. Right? Have you seen that on TV? Well, that's because it's true that Solomon wrote this many centuries ago that the tongue has the power over life and death. Go back to 20 again. A person's belly will be filled with the fruit of his mouth. That's why it's important for you not to confess it if you feel like you're coming down sick, but rather confess the truth, the powerful truth, prophetic prophesy over your body and say, I will not receive this illness. I do not receive this disease. I will not succumb to the adversary over my body. Why? Because Almighty Yahweh is my, well, I'll put it in Hebrew, Roe, my shepherd, Raphael, my king, my, my, my Raphael, my healer, my he, the one that makes me whole. <clears throat> in the book of James, it says that we are healed by his stripes that we were already healed by his stripes. And if we can only believe that and speak it out loud, you know, it's not possible for you to speak it out loud unless you believe it. So to make your body agree with the Spirit of God means that you force this tongue to speak in his terms, not yours. See yourself as an almighty powerful prophet of the almighty himself, that he's commanded you in your, in your book here to speak the words that will be producing the kind of fruit you want in your mouth. What kind of fruit do you want? You want to be counted as diseased and dying? Is there anybody else that you confess that over that you want to take it back? Well, it might help if you go before them and tell them that you spoke it and ask them to forgive you and take it back. Amen. Why? Because that resets the whole calendar there. That resets, resets all actions that were caused by you. Now, they're going to have to do the same thing. If they ex agreed with your words, then they need to uh, speak it out and, and curse those words that they received from you. So all these things have to fall into place. When it does, you're going to see a miraculous healing. Amen. Your finances. How many times have we cursed our finances? I make enough money. I don't need any more. Well, how come you don't have enough to give to every good work when, when you feel an urge to try to help somebody and it's not there for you? What have you done? You've cursed your own finances, so you can't do that. I don't need any more. I got enough. That's what you say. And I make an announcement in the heavenlies right now. I'm just teaching, so don't you follow these words for me. 
Do you understand what I just did? Did you know there is a heavenly court? Did you know that this week's Torah teaching, and I'm going to bring that up right now, is from Numbers chapter 30. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel, and he said, Here is what Yahweh has ordered. When a man makes a vow to Yahweh, or formally obligates himself by swearing an oath, he is not to break his word, but is to do everything he said he would do. If you have ever made a vow to tithe to Yahweh, you have better make sure that where you're tithing to is a place that honors him. Otherwise, you are not following through with your own words. Does this make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> When a woman makes a vow to Yahweh, formally obligating herself, while she is a minor living in her father's house, then if her father has heard what she vowed or obligated herself to, to do and holds, to his, and holds his peace, then all of her vows remain binding. I know of a man whose daughter went out and mad, married a low-life scoundrel, a drug dope dealing, possibly even a murderer. And she came home and told her dad that she had uh, uh, married him in a court of law. And he says, I reject it. I will not allow this to be accomplished. This isn't what my daughter should be doing. And I don't want her to be bound up as one flesh with this, with this filthy criminal who at the very least is a drug dealer if not a murderer. I reject that curse. I curse that curse and will not allow it to proceed. And guess what happened? About three months later, she came in and told her dad that she had gone and had her marriage annulled. She, her vows were annulled. You get it? That's powerful. That's powerful. There was a woman who, every time somebody asked how her family's doing, oh, it's so horrible. My children are all sinners, and my husband, he's the worst of them all. And somebody finally said to her, don't you realize what you're doing when you say those words? You're obligating them to that lifestyle, whether they have a choice in it or not. You should start confessing over them what you want. My husband is a man of God and he leads my children into righteousness. She started doing that. Every time somebody said, how's your family? My husband is a righteous man of God and he leads my children into righteousness. And within a matter of weeks, they had all accepted the Lord and were were worshiping with them together to worship God. Within a matter of weeks, your tongue has the power of life and death in it. Do you understand? And we must learn to use it properly. Amen. Amen. I don't know how you could get much clearer than that. And we're out of time, so I guess I better stop for the moment. But we will proceed with our service here in just a few minutes. So don't go away. Don't change the channel. Keep watching us online. We'll be right back. <laughs> 